we're here to talk about bougie assisted cricothyrotomy. And I think this is an important topic to talk about. And before we get into it, I have a few kind of housekeeping things just to make sure we're all on the same page. So first of all, if you have any questions throughout the talk, be sure to put them over in the chat uh, feature and I will answer those as soon as the talk is over. The second thing is, is that I released a blog post at seven o'clock central standard time this morning that goes over everything we're gonna talk about on this talk on the Rebel EM website. And I will share a QR code with you at the very, very end that will give you access to it. At the very end of this talk, we're going to actually do a live demo. I actually, you guys can't see it, but I have an overhead rig with a camera hanging over and I have a 3D Crike model trainer and we're gonna actually go through the steps of the procedure. And then the last thing is, is well, why bougie assisted cricothyrotomy? And this is what I call a halo procedure. So what do I mean by halo? Halo is high acuity, low occurrence. This is one of those things that when we need to do it, we need to do it well, but it doesn't happen enough. And just to give you an example, I've been practicing medicine for 15 years now, and I've only done five of these in a real person. I've done over hundreds of them in simulation, but I've only done five in real life. And so that's why I think this is so important to talk about, because at the end of the day, this is the final common pathway in the cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate, or the cannot intubate, cannot ventilate scenario. This is going to be the final pathway to that. Now, why bougie assisted cricothyrotomy? And there's really three important facets here that I want you guys to kind of understand. Why am I talking about this technique as opposed to some of the kind of pre-made kits? Well, number one is it's simple and it's rapid. Anybody who's practiced this in simulation knows how clunky things can be, how stressful it is. And so I want it to be the least amount of steps, the least amount of equipment, and as fast as possible, because that's what the patient needs. The second thing I like about this procedure is there's really no special equipment, as you'll see here in a minute. It's things that we have in the back of ambulances that we have in the emergency department that we can readily get our hands on, that we can have in our airway kits. It's nothing special. And there have been multiple studies, meta-analyses, and systematic reviews that have looked at this procedure, and it's got a super high success rate and a very low complication rate. And so that's the other reason I like this. And those are the three main facets of why I've chosen to speak about bougie-assisted cricothyrotomy. So I said simple, right? So what equipment do you actually need? And the reality is, is you really only need three things. You need a 10 or an 11 blade scalpel. Some people prefer the 11 blade, that's the pointy one. Uh, some people do the 10 blade. I personally prefer the 10 blade, but there's no science that says one is superior to the other. I just think it's easier with the 10 blade scalpel. You need a bougie, which we should all have. And then either a 6.0 or a 6.5 endotracheal tube, depending on the size of the lumen that we're going to be going into. So three things. And then I would add one more thing, your finger. That's the last thing that you need for this procedure to be successful. So this is all stuff that's readily available. You could package this up into one little Ziploc bag and have it ready to go. The next thing is we have to understand the anatomy when we're looking at a person's neck because we're already stressed out. And so this is not the time to be wondering which space am I going into? Am I in the right spot? So it's important to have an understanding of the anatomy. And what I have here is this uh, cartoon drawing and looking at the bony structures and cartilaginous structures from cranial to caudal, you have your hyoid bone, you have your thyroid cartilage, you have your cricoid cartilage, and then you have your trachea. And the space we're going for is this cricothyroid ligament or cricothyroid membrane, whichever you prefer to call it. And the final thing is, is that remember, we're talking cricothyrotomy, not tracheostomy. Um, I'm sure there's no confusion about this, but sometimes I find people getting confused. And so I just wanted to make sure that I clarified that. We're going in that space between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. 
the final thing I want to tell you is like, how big is this space that we're actually shooting for? And it's not very big, you know, in adults, it's anywhere from one to two centimeters horizontally and one to two centimeters vertically. So we're talking less than an inch of space as we're making these cuts on a person's neck. So this is why it's so important to understand the anatomy of the neck and the space that we're going for. Now, what I have here for you is the model we're going to be using at the very end where I'm doing the demo, because I want you guys to be familiar with the model so that you're not trying to figure out exactly what I'm doing with the overhead camera. And you can see that this 3D model has a thyroid cartilage at the top and a cricoid cartilage at the bottom, and then a cricothyroid ligament or membrane. This is what we're going to be targeting. What's cool about this 3D model, by the way, is you can see on the sides, you can actually put a strap around this, and this actually can sit on an actual person's neck. And then you can put moulage over it, and people can actually do the cricothyrotomy on an actual person. And don't worry, I've let people do this to me before with this model, and it's got metal plating on the back. So it's not like they can actually stab you in the neck. It's actually very safe, but it really increases that level of stress uh, for the person who's doing the procedure. Now, the next thing you need to know is how do I identify this on a person? That's great that you're showing me a 3D model, but what does this look like? And I like to use something called the laryngeal handshake that was created by Rich Levitan. Um, and basically what you do is you grab the entire larynx and throat with your hand, like you would do a handshake and you start palpating with your index finger. And so in this picture, I'm actually palpating the cricoid cartilage. I would usually start at the very top, feel my thyroid cartilage, feel the indention, and then feel the cricoid cartilage. And ultimately where that index finger is gonna end up is in that divot between the two, because that is where we're actually targeting and where we're wanting to go. Here it is on an actual person from left to right. You can see they're shaking the larynx from the top. They're bringing their hand down slowly. They're feeling the thyroid cartilage. Once they've identified that thyroid cartilage, they're using their index finger to find that little divot that I just shared with you on the 3D model. Now, before we go through the steps, because let me tell you, you can teach a monkey how to do a cricothyrotomy. The biggest issue and the hardest thing is the decision to cut. That is the hardest part of this procedure is cognitively telling yourself that you're going to be cutting on somebody's neck in a high stress situation for a halo procedure, something you don't do that often. And the reason I mention this is because it's typically performed too late. We wait too long and patients have bad outcomes. And there's two pieces to this. There's the time taken to act and there's the time taken to prepare. For the time taken to act with every airway that I'm going to be intubating somebody, I always have a plan A, B, and C. And ultimately my plan D is this bougie assisted cricothyrotomy. So I make sure that I mentally go through that in my head before I ever intubate anybody, because it's always a surprise when you put that laryngoscope in and there's a big mass there, or they have epiglottitis or there's something else that's going on. There's blood in the airway and you just cannot get access to the vocal cords to pass the tube. And so it's important to have this as part of your plan. And remember, common final pathway of a cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate, cannot intubate, cannot ventilate. The time taken to prepare, well, we've taken care of that because one of the first tenants that I told you about is I want it simple and with equipment that is readily available. A 10 or 11 blade scalpel, a bougie, and an endotracheal tube. It's very simple to put all that into a bag and have that set to the side as your plan D. So now you're no longer scrambling around looking for this stuff. The final thing is there's no contraindications to this procedure. Although we can talk about thyroid goiters and people being on anticoagulation, there's really no contraindication or at least absolute contraindication that I'm aware of. And so again, remember, this is your plan D. This is, you cannot intubate, you cannot oxygenate, cannot ventilate. There's no contraindication to this procedure. So you need to get that out of your head. 
So let's go through the procedure here on slides, and then ultimately we'll do this on the demo at the very end. So there's really two cuts. The first cut is gonna be a vertical cut from top to bottom. I have three centimeters up there, but really you want this to be as long as you need it to be, to be able to feel what you need to feel and see what you need to see. And after you make your vertical incision, you palpate with your index finger. Hopefully you've removed the scalpel from the field so you don't cut yourself or stab yourself. And you just confirm that you're in the right place. Once you've confirmed you're in the right place, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna stab in the middle. You're going to sweep over without removing the scalpel from that membrane. You're gonna twist and you're gonna come back across the other way. Now, the one thing I want to mention about this horizontal cut is you want to try and stay as caudal as possible. And the reason for this is that in some people, they will have cricothyroid arteries in the more superior aspect of this. And you want to try and avoid cutting those. If you ultimately do cut one, it's okay. They can be ligated. You can hold pressure. You can put figure of eight stitches in it. There's lots of things you can do that will get the bleeding to stop. And that's the next thing I want to mention is that people who do this in simulation, they're like, oh, this is easy. It's a vertical cut and then a stab, horizontal twist, horizontal, and I'm done. These things bleed and they bleed a lot. And you shouldn't be freaked out by that. The second thing I want to mention here is that once you punch into this hole, there is going to be blood splatter everywhere. And so you should make sure that you are protecting your eyes and protecting your face before you do this procedure, because I guarantee you, you will get sprayed with blood as that patient is breathing out of this new hole that you just created. So once you've done that, you remove the scalpel, you put your finger in the hole. So why am I putting the finger in the hole a second time? Because I've already created what I want. Well, number one is you confirm that you're in the laryngeal lumen. And two, you confirm that your incision is large enough that under the stress, you didn't cut this short, that you can fit a 6.0 or a 6.5 endotracheal tube into it. After this, the bougie slides in right behind your index finger. So while your index finger is in that lumen, you basically slide the bougie right behind it. Once you have that in there, you can now remove your index finger and you can load your endotracheal tube over the bougie and you basically advance that endotracheal tube over the bougie. You can now remove the bougie once you've inserted your endotracheal tube. Now there's something about this that I wanna mention here is the endotracheal tube is really long. And normally when we intubate people, we're going from the either the oropharyngeal or the nasopharyngeal pathway. So there's a lot more distance. We're now below the level of the vocal cords when we're doing this. And so the distance is much shorter. And in a stressful situation, people tend to cram these things in and then you end up doing a right main stem bronchus or causing some type of trauma. So what I like to use as a rule of thumb is I will advance the endotracheal tube until I see the balloon disappear. And then I'll go another one centimeter after the balloon disappears. And that's kind of where I stop. At some point, this can get swapped out for a trach, but that doesn't have to be done immediately. That can even be done in the emergency department or later on. So how do you secure this? Well, the same kind of endotracheal tube holders that we use for oral pharyngeal intubation, you can use those on the neck to secure this. You can use suture and tie it in so that it just stays in place. And so there's nothing fancy to it. The procedure is really a, a few simple steps, and that's as simple as I can make it for you. Now, the key here with HALO procedures is practice, practice, practice. I have a QR code here for you, which I also have in the blog post in case you don't get a picture of it now, that has a free 3D code that you can upload into any 3D printer, and you can create your own 3D model that you can actually use at home or at the station, or in the emergency department, or wherever you work. But the key is to practice. And what I'm going to tell you is that this is a procedure that I practice at least once or twice a month. I just do it at home. I have everything that I need, and you're going to see that here in just a second. But that's the only way you can keep fidelity with the procedure that you only do five times in a 15-year career. So this is something that many of us won't do, 
This is something a few of us have done once or twice, but it's certainly not common, but we have to be really good at it. So here's the 3D model that I'm going to be using just to get you oriented. And I have two types of tape here. I have electrical tape, which is basically going to serve as our cricothyroid membrane or ligament. And then I have foam tape that goes over that, which is basically serving as skin. And this is what the model's going to look like when I switch over to the overhead camera. I promised you a QR code that would have the blog post that has all this material, has snapshots of all the slides. It has everything there. Eventually, I hope to get a video up there as well that kind of goes through this procedure uh, so that you can also see it. But I do have hyperlinks back to the MCRIT website where he's actually got some great videos of this procedure in real time. And so I, I hope you find those useful and I hope you find the blog post useful. So this is the 3D model here that you can see that I, I showed you on the slides. And you can see how it's got the little side thing for a strap that can go around my neck. And then you can see the back of it. Obviously, we don't need to worry about that. I've already put on the mechanical tape, uh, the mechanical electrical tape. And I've also put on the foam tape to kind of create to save time for us. I have my um, 11, or I'm sorry, my 10 blade scalpel here that you can see. And then I have my bougie or a shortened version of the bougie. So I told you the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna do a laryngeal handshake. You're gonna start at the top. You're gonna kind of feel around for this thyroid cartilage. You're gonna feel this divot right here with my index finger. And then right beneath that, I'm gonna feel my cricoid cartilage. So this divot, and I'm purposely making this indented so you can see it visually, is where I'm actually targeting. So I told you the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna make a vertical cut. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna cut and I'm gonna come all the way down, make it as big as I need to. And then I'm gonna put my finger in here to make sure I'm in the right spot. So I'm gonna feel for my thyroid, I'm gonna feel for my cricoid cartilage, and yes, I'm right where I wanna be. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna make a stab. You're gonna come across horizontally, you're gonna twist, and then you're gonna come back horizontally, okay? And then you can just remove your scalpel. Your index finger goes in, so I'm in there. This is big enough for, I think, a 6.0 endotracheal tube. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take this bougie and I'm literally gonna slide it right behind my index finger and boom, you can see it coming out the bottom. And then the next step would be sliding the endotracheal tube over that. So that's basically bougie assisted cricothyrotomy with a virtual demo. And that's what I got for you guys. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Chris, thank you again for having me back. And I hope people found that useful.